Hi, I'm Dale Holliday, coming to you from Corvallis, Oregon, in the bountiful Willamette Valley. Welcome to my show, Valley Views. It's a forum for sharing relevant topics relating to people and issues in the Willamette region. Um, we have a fascinating show today. It's about the timely topic of dry farming. I'd like to welcome my guest. Her name is Amy Garrett, and she's the assistant professor at the Oregon State University Extension Service Small Farms Program. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So what can you tell us about dry farming? What is it? Dry farming is growing without supplemental irrigation in our dry season. So in the Willamette Valley, we typically get 40 plus inches of annual rainfall. Dry farming happens in places usually where there's 20 or more inches of annual rainfall. So we get plenty of rainfall. We have a lot of deep soils with good water holding capacity. So dry farming, uh, we've been working mostly with crops like um, tomatoes, potatoes, dry beans, squash, melon, zucchini. Those are the, some of the crops we're growing this year. But So growing during our dry season without supplemental irrigation using uh, a variety of practices I can tell you about. And I have to put in here, you know, Amy came to this interview carrying this bin of this beautiful produce, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little more later, but I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm getting hungry. There's tomatoes and uh, beautiful cucumbers, and what kind of melons are those, Amy? This is an Eel River melon, which is a dry farm variety from a plant breeder in Northern California. Hmm. Well, Amy, what can you tell me about the importance of this? Why, why would anyone be interested in dry farming? What's, what's the deal here? I've been in my position with uh, the Extension Service for about six years, and I learned pretty quickly that a majority of the landowners that I work with are on land without water rights. Hmm. So they call into the extension office typically and are, they say, hey, I just moved on to this piece of property and we're trying to decide what to grow here. So we talk about soil type and water rights. And I was learning over my first few years that I was working with mostly landowners that were on land without water rights or limited water availability. Mm -hmm. So then we talk about cropping options and historically we will recommend um, pasture or a limited number of crops, mostly um, we'll do some grains or something. But I had met some farmers in about 2013, one in particular that had been dry farming a variety of crops that I had mentioned earlier mm -hmm. without any supplemental irrigation and organically for 40 years. Yeah. So I just started visiting with uh, this farmer and then I went down uh, to California in 2015 in our drought year and visited mm -hmm. with other farmers that were using some of these practices and just documented what crops and what varieties where they were uh, growing and how they were doing it. Mm -hmm. And then we did a demonstration in 2015 as well um, at the Oak Creek Center for Urban Horticulture. So uh -huh. that's on the southwest corner of campus here in Corvallis. I just took what I, I had been documenting and tried to apply it on the ground and thought, well, hey, if I can do this, I bet mm -hmm. a lot of other people can Absolutely. do this too. Yeah. Given that it was a drought year, we expected maybe 20 or 30 people to show up and we had more than 100 people show oh, up. Big interest. And that was where I, I did a follow-up survey with those folks and 90% uh, of them said that they planned to experiment on their own. That piece of information, I, I thought, well, what can I do to facilitate and support these people who are experimenting on their own? So that's where this dry farming collaborative kind of took shape and uh, initiated in 2016. So now we have nearly 400 people on our Facebook group, but uh -huh. we have 30 different farms as far north as Port Townsend, Washington, and as far south really as, um, well, there's a couple folks in Northern California. We are doing uh, variety trials this year, looking at what crops and varieties do well in our specific bioregion for collecting data, sharing information. So Very that's right. what we're up to this yeah. year. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say there's no additional irrigation, so these, these crops... Um, grow with just our normal rainfall from that year and yeah. that's it. So we're using a variety of practices to uh, retain water in the soil, okay. retain soil moisture from our winter rains for summer crop growth. Crop and variety of selection is really important, mm -hmm. um, so early maturing or drought tolerant varieties and even we have some dry farm varieties in our in our mix this year. Also increased plant spacing so the plants aren't competing with each other as much for the limited moisture in the soil. Mm -hmm. And the plants, uh, the, they're rooting more deeply. Since we're not irrigating at the surface, they um, are sending their roots down more deeply. 
We are also doing organic matter addition. So we cover crop and we do compost addition. Each farm has a little different um, nutrient management regime, but organic matter addition really increases soil water holding capacity. And there's not really one way to do this. Gardeners experimenting with kind of different deep mulching techniques, but then on a field scale, farmers that are on 10 or so acres, it looks a little bit different. So there's not one way to do this. So right. we're kind of expand, building and expanding our drought mitigation toolbox so that mm-hmm. people in different situations with different equipment and different soils can pick from this toolbox and select what work, what's going to work for That's them. That's great. So it's not a cookie cutter thing. No. There's a lot of creativity involved. And yeah. you could, it, it adds to more people being able to do this. A lot of people yeah. would like a recipe, like you do A, B, and C, mm-hmm. and then you can get beautiful dry farm melons. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily that way. A lot of the people right. involved in this are experimenting and being really observant and yeah, it's not a cookie yeah. cutter thing. Mm-hmm. It hasn't been mainstream knowledge, but mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to do with this work is make it more of a normal option, not this kind of strange alternative, uh-huh. just by bringing that information to the forefront again and then having some data, some numbers to help tell the story and not, not just be anecdotal. We're trying to just supply some more information and fill in the gaps there mm-hmm. and, uh, and build this network of people. It's really this collaborative network of people that are sharing information that is our most valuable resource mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, and you know what, that community resiliency, I'm hearing that term mm-hmm. tossed out a lot these days in, in this crazy troubled world. People are thinking, okay, the big picture is maybe not looking so good, but what can we do on a local level? So this mm-hmm. is definitely food security and resiliency that people are starting to look for, you yeah. know, building small in, in the community. Do you have any help with this, aside from the collaborative farmers? And, yeah, you know? I was um, fortunate. Um, we got a, some grant support from the USDA Northwest uh, Climate Hub. And that uh, enabled me to hire Anna Duncan, who is our research analyst on this project. There's the Innovation Group um, has been helping with our data analysis, and Andy Gallagher has been helping with our soil sampling, and the farmers involved have provided input on how to set up our trials. And um, yeah, we're just starting to get some funding to support our work and are applying for some more grants. We started thinking about grant funding not being a super sustainable way to kind of keep our our, mm. our project going. So we do have a donation tab on our website that we're going to start promoting more this coming year. Uh-huh. Good. Uh, just trying to even, you know, just for our seed costs, you know, stuff like that would yeah. really help us um, keep mm-hmm. keep growing because we are, we anticipate this year we have 30 trial hosts. We anticipate at least 50 next year because people keep on stepping on with interest and growing. So. I sure hope so. Yeah. I hope so, yes. <laughs> now, what is your website address? It's mm-hmm. smallfarms.oregonstate.edu. Mm-hmm. If you go to our, our homepage there, on the right-hand side, there's a tab for Dry Farming Project, and that's where you can get all the access to our website resources, and what we've been doing so far. Mm -hmm. We also have a Facebook page, the Dry Farming Collaborative, and that's where the most information sharing is happening right now. People will share pictures and videos and have discussions about tillage and different types of mulching and should I trellis. Mm -hmm. So that is really a great archive of information of what kind of discussions Mm -hmm. have been happening around this topic. Nice, okay. Well, you know, I, I love apples. And I eat apples just about all year round, but especially in the fall. Now, are there any orchards that are doing this? There's a dry farmed orchard in Northern California. That's Newcomb Family Farm. And uh, Newcomb Family Farm mentored uh, Andrew Shores, and he's at Ridgeline Meadows Farm in Southern Oregon. And Andrew has been a mentor for Dan Schuler, who has Moondogs Farm there in uh, Marcola. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a beautiful story of how this kind of knowledge of dry farmed orchard establishment and management has been passed down farmer to farmer. So we're gonna try to case study, we plan on case studying this dry farmed orchard establishment, this new one going in this fall in Springfield at Moondogs Farm, and uh, really do some rootstock evaluation, like what rootstocks support uh, are more conducive to dry farming. So um, we have mostly M7 and M111 rootstocks, and, and Dan has a variety of uh, plums and apples. And oh, nice. We're trying to figure out some ways to get some, to support, some support to um, do some more uh, data collection of this. Uh, mm. and, and so it's not uh, just the farmer's responsibility to train everybody else how to do it. We can kind of make that information right. more mm-hmm. accessible. So we're starting a dry farm 
production systems extension publication series hmm. and we're gonna start releasing that next year we hope to start building this and it'll all be free and available to the public all oh this that's wonderful yeah. so people even just with a little garden plot maybe in their backyard or their side yard could even practice this dry farming yeah mm-hmm. I think a lot of, a lot of farmers say that this is kind of more of a field scale mm-hmm. uh, so it's gonna look a lot okay. different on a field scale than in on like a little hundred square foot block sure um, um, but yeah, I think there, there are uh, gardeners involved as well. The Benton mm-hmm. County Master Gardeners and the Marion County Master Gardeners had dry farming uh, demonstrations this year oh, in, in their plots. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. yeah, there is definitely a lot of gardener interest in this. And we would love to expand and do more outreach with those folks and start connecting with the school gardens as well. I would love to collaborate with master gardeners and doing outreach with school gardens because that's something we're trying to do but don't really have the capacity. So I'm doing that as a call out to master gardeners who want to do dry farm demos at school gardens. Get in touch with me. All right. The website or the Facebook page. Um, But yeah, anybody who wants to host a dry farming uh, demonstration in their master gardener plot or community garden plot, we would love for you to be involved. Yeah. Now, if uh, for v- listeners in the Corvallis area, um, well, and, and beyond, would we find some of these uh, dry farm uh, produce at the f- local farmer's market? This year we're starting to, um, some of the people who are involved in uh, the Dry Farming Collaborative are mm-hmm. starting to market their produce and mm-hmm. label it as dry farmed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think in the next few years you're going to see start to see more dry farm produce enter the market. Just a note there that dry farming is not a yield maximization strategy, but we do a lot of times get a, a really tasty produce, uh, mm-hmm. more concentrated in flavor, and oftentimes longer storing. Um, Alex oh, Stone nice. in the horticulture department at OSU is doing mm-hmm. some work with winter squash, and there are some varieties varieties that um, store a lot longer dry farmed than they do if they were irrigated. So if you see a dry farmed tomato or a dry farmed melon or squash sitting next to one that's irrigated, uh, if it costs, you know, uh, you know, 10 cents or 25 cents more, know that, yeah, it has these other qualities, Absolutely. like concentrated flavor and some, and a lot of times longer storing as Give well. it a try. Well, um, I don't know if there are any events coming up that you wanted to talk about. We're going to be at various farm conferences this mm-hmm. um, this winter. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if you just look up uh, on our website, we'll, we'll keep updating with what events we'll be attending Beautiful. and um, share our results as we start to summarize those from this year's trials. And mm-hmm. the Facebook page is a great place to kind of connect up with us. Cool. Type in Dry Farming Collaborative and Facebook, and that's uh, that's a public group. You can join that, and that's a great way to plug in. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for coming. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Happy to share. You've been listening to Valley Views. I'm your host, Dale Holliday, and I'd love to hear from you. Comments, questions, ideas for future topics, or other matters you'd like explored. Email me at valleyviews360 at gmail.com. That's V-A-L-L-E-Y... V I E W S three six O at gmail dot com. This show is produced at Corvallis Access Media with special thanks to Chad Howard. In the Willamette Valley, you can find KBU at one o four point three FM on your radio dial. I look forward to being with you again next Friday. And remember, as Doctor Who once said, I'm not in charge. But I'm full of ideas. Bye-bye.